Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld. Welcome to another Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn, now part of the Cloud 2030 uh, group. And in this session, we had a general discussion about topics that we want to hear, and we actually riffed on the topics for quite a while. So entertaining uh, and informative as a, as a lunch topic. Uh, the sessions are moving over into here, and so if you want to talk, propose, help organize, uh, please join the 2030.mn.co uh, discussion. It's cloud2030.mn.co uh, and, and jump in. Be part of the DevOps Lunch and Learns, or if you want to be part of the strategic discussions we're having in Cloud 2030. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. It was a lot of fun. And it's been one of those days. Everything's breaking. <laughs> I understand. That was that was all weekend. So, oh man, I'm sorry to hear that. That sucks. Fighting, trying to uh, trying to uh, do an all DRP installation of a compute cluster. So, oh, there you go. I I am happy to that <laughs> happy to talk about that if you want I'm trying to make i'm trying to make an edge lab work and something's going on with edge lab for me so understood I'm supposed to do a demo this evening and so i'm recording it it's one of the beauties of these the new uh the new format is you can record a demo and and make it do whatever you want <laughs> the uh oh yeah, actually, I'm, I'm super. If, if you want, Shane, Shane usually shows up for this, and I can ping him. Um, I so here's, I'll I'll start this way. The agenda. There he is. There he's <laughs> the man. Speaking of, and more people to promote. So we have a all star lineup coming in the next three weeks. Uh, probably four weeks. Um, uh, so Charity Majors, Ed Horley, um, I'm blanking, uh, Lindy Brandon is coming, and somebody else who I should be able to remember. But it's been one of those days, so I don't. No, that's it. <laughs> Chris Short was last week, so, um, and so I and with the cloud twenty thirty. So here's here's what I was thinking for agenda, but I'm happy to go wherever people want. We have this sort of standing managing a DevOps team uh, topic that you know I think is always a is it we had we didn't quite get to last time. We turned it into QA and DevOps. Um, so that that's a good that's a good standing topic, and we can certainly talk about that. Um, there's a ton of logistics changes that are going on with the Cloud 2030 pieces, and so I would talk to this group about Cloud 2030 a bit, um, and and start expanding. That also makes it easier to expand the leadership, so that uh, if y'all want to bring speakers, um, have discussions outside of this lunch the cloud 2030 stuff really makes it possible to do that. Um, and so those, you know, I was, I was actually going to turn this, this session into a bit more of an administrative logistics and general discussion since I've got topic speakers lined up for the next couple topics. And it's good to sometimes dwell on logistics and management of the group a bit. Um, and then I'm, you know, Patrick, if you want to use, if we, if it evolves to that, we can then spend some time on troubleshooting and talking. I'm happy on that too. Uh, does that sound reasonable for people? And I know we're, we're still early in the, the topic. So I, what I would do is I would say in a couple minutes, I'll start talking about cloud 2030 and what that, what that means. Other, other suggestions. None for me. <laughs> Are there topics that people would like to see more of? It's always useful for me to know if there's some backlog of like, ah, I wish I could get educated about. Mm. Let's see, there's uh... Favorite pizza toppings, favorite <laughs> ice cream flavors. 
It's There's very important to running on cloud. Contra controversial topics, uh, surprisingly controversial topics on that one. Indeed. Um, there's there's some that, that we can do sort of out of hand, like I've been doing some Helm chart type stuff and automation for Helm charts, um, which I, there was, I had a learning curve on that. So that was, uh, that was interesting. Um, Has anybody interacted with, I'm going to mess the name up, Pulumi? Mm -hmm. We had a, we had a Pulumi session a couple of uh, weeks ago and it's recorded. Oh, excellent. I'll, I'll go look for that. Cause that uh, I'm, I kind of, I, br I brushed up against that a little bit. A friend of mine kind of mentioned it to me in passing and I took a gander and it looked, it looked interesting. Um, me, I'm more <laughs> focused on bare metal rather than cloud, but uh, it looked, it looked a little far fetched, but also interesting. So I'm the, kinda... this, we had like their CTO do a, a discussion on it. Um, and he went way down in the, the bits and bytes hmm. um, and, and talked about it a bit. So that was, that was a good session. I'd, I'd highly recommend that one. Um, and we can come back and, and look at it more. Um, it's, it's a little sad to me because we, we end up doing a ton with Terraform and not as much with Pulumi. Um, but there's things about Pulumi that I really like. So... Um, Multiple language choice seems very nice and uh, being able to bring in whatever language of choice as your executor just seems very cool or not as your executor, but as your kind of as your kind of orchestrator, I want to say it seems interesting, but And that's that's the thing that I'm I, I left that still a little bit confused about like it's super nice to be able to write a script that has standard shims into some of these cloud interface things, which is what, you know, that's what you get out of Terraform. It certainly isn't generic. Every Terraform plan I write to do, even to, if it does the same thing, is different. It's um, really painful. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then they break it. I, I, I have my Terraform rant from last week where um, it wouldn't run a plan I wrote until I ran the upgrade to plan uh, v v0.13. But when I diffed the, the changes to that plan, there were no bytes changed. Hmm. So I'm like, how did you know that this wasn't what you wanted? We just want to force you to update to the latest anyhow. It's just okay. wanted to force your, you to run this extra command to say, I'm, uh, yeah. Uh. Um, but that was, so yeah, the Pulumi thing is, was pretty good. And one of the things that, that they made a big point about, which is useful, is that they have an, some integrated secrets pieces um, compared to storing your secrets all over the place. For, for rebar, you know, we do secrets also, so it's not as big a win from that yeah. perspective. But she, secrets are super hard. Um, if actually, you're not that using would be, Vault or something like that already. And that, that would actually be a, a really good topic um, for us to talk about a secret, a secret system, secrets. Um, Hashi Vault, not Ansible Vault. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Gotta love that one. Namespace collisions are always fun. Ansible Vault? What does Ansible Vault do? Uh, it's right. basically just a way of uh, encrypting a secret inside of an Ansible playbook. Oh, okay. And it, you can do inline or you can do, you know, so you can actually do an inline encrypt or you can do a uh, um, replacement from hidden file. You can do, okay. Uh, there's a couple different ways to, to kind of leverage it, but it's Ansible's own vault system and it's called vault, of course. Of course. And uh, yeah, so the, the name collision with, uh, you know, HashiCorp vault is, is, is quite fun, but. Uh, and that's evolved quite a bit over the years because they, they originally it was very basic where you could just have a hidden file and you know you would tell it you know <laughs> this is my vault and this is my secret and this is where all my secrets for all of my Ansible playbooks are and go read this file and replace what's in there with what's in the hidden file essentially and, and then you would only have a single uh, symmetric encryption decryption key 
Exactly. It was very, very, I remember blind, that, yeah. very, very blind. And uh, it's evolved quite a bit since then. And it's, it's better, but it's still nothing on the line of like a, a, a one size fits all kind of secret system, kind of like HashiCorp's fault. But <sighs> it's interesting. That has so that its sounds, own problems. <laughs> that sounds like a good, a good topic for us in the future. I, it's always one that makes my head sort of explode. So. From that, from that well, and it's one of those, it's like, how secure do you need to be for your secrets? Um, you know, if you're operating on an internal only network, if you're only ever publishing over, you know, encrypted connections, you know, how, 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 how secret does a, a secret need to be? And, but then you get into the whole, well, I'm doing everything as uh, committing everything as code everything is committed into to RCS system. So what secrets are now committed to my RCS system? You know, and, and auditing, that's always fun. Uh, that's actually one, one of the things that, uh, that attracted me to the, the GitOps approach to in, in Kubernetes and that you can, for the most part, separate those. You, you have your uh, your uh, your manifest your declarations be basically just the templates uh, for what you want to deploy, and then the secrets get checked at the last moment. And uh, how you provision the secrets, secrets, it's up to you. It can be done with Hashivolt, or it can be uh, Kubernetes secrets that you create in, in, in the environment and leave there, or uh, whatever else. Are, are you using uh, the GitHub Actions pieces? I haven't. I would love to learn more about that from a general topic. I know people have been have played with it. I don't. I don't think we've invested any time in it. Um, we we use it. Um, it's it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, the Actions marketplace is very unrefined. Um, reminds me of the Jenkins plugin landscape, where it, it might be nice, it might be just uh, like spaghetti code. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, like the the GitHub, like running things with GitHub Actions is fairly straightforward. Um, they have good integration for their for their hooks, so that's a bonus in that. Uh, in the end. Uh, we decided to just go with concourse, and uh, uh, it, it meant a little bit more of a higher uh, entry uh, curve uh, in, in setting up the concourse pipelines because they're more basic levels where you have to implement a lot of things yourself. Okay. But uh, it, it did give us more control, and um, it, particularly as to where uh, we could run our, our agents or workers, depending on what pipeline you, you're talking about. Would, would you be willing to talk about that as a, as a topic? Um, Can you? It's always I, the first question. I mean, I, I, I am willing uh, to chat about it. Uh, okay. I, I, I definitely that there's no... NDA kind of limitation that would prevent me from it. Um, I don't know how much time I have to prepare something, uh, so it would be more like a by the seat of your pants kind of uh, <laughs> fireside chat. Uh, <laughs> That's always been the goal for for these sessions: is not to put somebody into a uh, PowerPoint mode, but to to be able to say this is what we're doing and then and then talk about it. like like to me lunch and learn's always been a casual um, session where it, it's not supposed to be uh, a lot of you know, you, to me if it, we could just literally shut up and let you keep talking and that would be <laughs> the presentation and I'd be happy about that because um, that's what I, I'm always curious about like, the GitHub actions and I don't I think people on our team have like like poked at it and not enough to be worth switching anything off of Travis, which is what we use. Um, um, if we knew we were going to talk about it. Yeah, sorry. 
No, uh, I was just gonna say if you're if you're happy with with Travis, then uh, I don't see any, any reason to switch away. Um, <laughs> like budget wise, it might be a little bit more affordable. Um, you don't get the option of doing builds for multiple platforms. So if that's something that you're looking for, then Travis or Circle CI is probably going to be a better choice. Um, particularly if you're, if you're targeting Macs. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you, I, 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 I don't think there's any choice other than Travis for, for Macs. Huh, I hadn't even thought about that. This would it would be something where I'd I'd actually ask uh, from our team Greg to come in, just be part of the conversation because I know we've we've been doing Travis for years, um, and we do all sorts of crazy like generate our docs out of it. And there's all sorts of stuff that we do. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. In my experience, uh, almost all of these pipeline products they're they're interchangeable. Uh, some may have a feature that may make it more desirable for one application than another, but ultimately, um, but when when it comes to say like the, the thought that was like, well, is is this good for me? Um, my philosophy is more: over, is this good enough for me? You're never going to find it in the, the perfect tool. So so just. Uh, if if it works, stick with it. If it doesn't, find something else. That's the ultimate answer for ops in general, right? There are some that I found that there are some that work a little bit better depending upon your use case. Like, sadly, I'm I'm kind of stuck with Jenkins for a lot of my work, um, or Harness um, is what I've started looking into a little bit more. But Jenkins is kind of what I get stuck with because of EDA workloads and in working in silicon. Mm -hmm because some of the vendors that we have to work with have very specific Jenkins plugins, you know, Cadence and Mentor and, you know, the big EDA software vendors tend to have, they'll pick one CI system that they'll work with and nothing else. And, and usually, you know, that's even kind of an afterthought. Um, but then like container-based workflows, I found like CodeFresh and things like that. They, that that's a CI system that works really, really well. Um, if you're all container based, um, specifically Docker containers, um, I, I just, I, I found that the CI system, it kind of depends upon what your workload is really. Yeah. Um, makes sense. Uh, also it, it, it affects on, on whether you want your workers to be persistent or, or ephemeral. Mm. Like, um, as ugly as configuring Jenkins is, um, the nice thing about Jenkins for, particularly for Kubernetes workers, is that they get created on demand and then get torn down. Uh, Argo CD is uh, one of, sorry, no, the Drone CI mm -hmm. is one of the mm -hmm. few others that has uh, like on demand worker provisioning. And it has also other nice features, like if you want to go beyond containers or, or need something that needs a VM specifically, I can integrate with uh, with CloudPress, like DigitalOcean, for example, and create a VM just for the build and then delete it. Um, but then other other types of uh, of pipelines like GitHub Actions and uh, Concourse, uh, they they have a more of a static set of workers uh, that um, that's basically like your your worker pool where where you just run things. Um, GitLab is also, you can do static or dynamic with GitLab for your workers. Yeah. You can actually run static and dynamic concurrently with uh, GitLab now, which is pretty cool. I actually really like GitLab as a feature, you know, uh, as, as, as an alternative solution to GitHub, but also as a, um, as a CI system, their CI system has actually kind of evolved massively. Uh, since its beginning, and it's actually quite usable now, uh, either hosted or um, or SaaS model. And, and then there's the, the Atlassian tool, which 
Oof. No, no, no. A- everybody <laughs> mentions it. <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that, that thing needs you. to burn. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Atlassian seems to be falling from grace on, on their stuff. I, we've, I haven't seen a lot of fans of late. They sell their stuff as an integrated suite because they've acquired all of these various pieces, but not a single one of them is uniform across the board. Not a single one of them uses the same mm-hmm. APIs. Not a single one of them uses the same rest call set. Not a single, I mean, it, it's, it's getting the same markup language across tool, uh, <laughs> across them. It's even, like, there you go. Exactly. Like, Alpha I mean, is a different markup than, than Jira. <laughs> Yeah, and they have extremely predatory uh, user management practices. They mm. massively pissed me off. Massively. They, if you create um, uh, invites to add people to an organization, they start billing you for those users, even if the user never ever accepts the invite. So that's like saying, I'm going to host a dinner party. I'm going to charge $50 a plate. I've invited all of you. And by the way, you all now owe me $50 whether you show up or not. Yep. Crazy. Yep. But it's only, but it's only 50 bucks for your three seat, you know, uh, entry bite. Oh, yeah, well, I'm not that nice. No free <laughs> seats for all of you. But then, but then once you get your entry bite, you then actually have to, uh, I, I love the the fact that the plugin cost scales with your number of users, like for Jira or for for Confluence. So, like you you find a Confluence uh, plugin that you know your your users demand to have. They've got to have this newfangled widget that you know sets up their their drawings or whatever in their Confluence pages. And then you go look at the pricing, and it scales to the number of users of your instance, not the number of users who are actually using it. So. You have a 250 user license for your Confluence. You have to buy the 250 you know, 250 seat plugin for you know every plugin that you want. You can't pick and choose. It's painfully expensive. Yeah. But yeah, managing it is is quite not a lot of fun, and and even from a user experience, just the differences between their various tools in their their suite of software <laughs> is is difficult because of it's all acquired it's all diff you know each each one of them is different and they're all completely divergent with regards to how they work yeah i was i know we've been using trello boards for a long time and then mm. they finally yanked all the free plans and turned them into jira accounts mm. and we we didn't migrate that over but what alternatives are out there now these days? Yeah. For Jira or for Trello? Yes. Um, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, Depends if you're doing is... software management or if you're doing Jira for help desk or, I mean, there's so many different facets of it that you can be used for. Um, there are alternatives for almost all of them, but none of them, sadly, none of them have the market share and none of them have the user base um, or the, the com- comfortability for your users because <laughs> Atlassian made such a huge push over the last five years. Yeah. Jira, Jira definitely seemed to be dominating the market. I know we just switched to Zen, Zendesk. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, it was hard. We had to, there, there are some features where we wanted to have users be able to pick, see their tickets. And so there's a user delegation tenanting thing, which is a pretty sophisticated feature in the end. Um, and there's the, and, and the hosting component, right? I, I don't know how people feel about it. There's a degree of, it's always a risk, but if you're hosting your own troubling, trouble ticket system, right? You potentially make it, you know, you, you put it in the failure path if you're having some type of, of outage or issue. So there is a degree of nicety to be able to say, you know, if everything else is down, you know, we're, <laughs> we're not our, our, Trouble ticket system is not is not also down. Um, That's why I generally will have my internal trouble trouble ticketing system, which is you know uh, on prem or whatever, or um, or you know based upon our internal system, and then we'll have an external you know um, dashboard of services that you can have that is exposed to the the world. 
that usually lives in a standalone cloud instance, either in GCE or GCP or, or some other place that that's, that's our, are we down, you know, kind of indicator. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, we, can, we can log in from our phone and kind of update it type thing in the case of a, a, a you know, the, the dump truck that drives through the fiber, which I've had happen now about 10 times in my career. Oh, um, and yeah. yeah, taking out all of the redundant providers because they happen to cross the highway on the same bundle. Yeah. Paying for multiple providers and having them come over the same ingress, physical ingress point, and then having something hit the ingress point and take out all your redundancy. I, it's always it's, fun. It's, you, if you're in business, in the business long enough, you get, you get stuff like that, right? I thought there was a rack space story that I heard where like somebody literally drove a truck through the wall of the data center. Mm. Um, and you know, it's, yeah, no, you, you see it. It's, it's not uncommon yeah. from that perspective. Um, phys physical world intrudes. Yeah. And that's, I, I saw sort of, that. Go ahead. I saw that a co-location provider I used in the nineties called Globix. And they had these buildings that they were very proud of here in California that could float up to 50 feet in a quake. And they were disconnected from three separate aggregate points on the outside of the building to power and uh, network. Okay. But what I'm telling was power and network points, home run back to a single place on the street where a backhoe had dug them up. It took the entire uh, redundant. Yeah. That's it's. There are remarkable single points of failure in all the in all this stuff, um, and it's super hard to troubleshoot them or, or predict them. Kube is full of them. How, anything particular jump out at you? I'm curious. Not anymore. I I try. I was a very early adopter to Kube. Um, mm -hmm. You know, back when it still had a lot of trappings of Borg. And okay. um, so way way back, and uh, trying to jump on that bandwagon kind of wholeheartedly. And that was a bad idea because I kept running into um, issues with self healing and things like that, where, Oh, well, I, I can't, I can't re I can't um, rebuild because I don't have a context for what I am. You know, things like that, where it just, there were lots of places where there were hooks for things that weren't built yet. And that was to provide layers of redundancy that just weren't there. Um, but this is, you know, again, in the early days. So I don't know how much it's evolved since then. I've kind of backed quickly <laughs> away from it um, because it, in my line of work, it's not, uh, it adds too much latency for my jobs and things like that. I'm not in the microservices. I'm in the, I need a machine with, you know, two terabytes of RAM and, and you know, 128 cores and that sort of thing. So it's mm -hmm. a, it's a little bit different for me. Um, so running Kube in my environment just generally doesn't work because uh, I need as fast as fast memory access as possible. No hypervisor, no nothing in the way, kind of sure. thing. So that's I've been I've been watching the Kube community. So I spent some time um, looking at cluster API. Oops, you jumped <laughs> over, hold on. I became spotlighted for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why, yeah. There we go. Jumped over. <laughs> Psychologically, didn't I? Oh, I'm um, just, I'm watching your cat in the background kind of go back and forth, back and forth. It's kind of well, awesome. Well, he's a loop, so. Oh, is it really? Yeah. That's... Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> you yeah, that's a loop. It's about a five minute loop. So Okay, I was wondering, it's like he, he seems to be you know, do, or she seems to be doing the same repetitive behavior, but maybe there's just something really interesting in that window. There you go. Here, here you go. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's okay. my that's my fake window. Uh, there you go. Here. Excellent. It is actually my window. It's just not Is it okay? Because I mean it <laughs> looks fairly realistic. I mean, it, you know, it's like okay, all right, yeah. I'll take that, you know. That's cool. <laughs> The dog, the dog's more distracting. Indeed. Um, oh yeah, I've been, I've been, I tried to spin up Cluster API uh, a couple of weekends ago, and it was a lot more, lot more 
intermediate steps than I was expecting to take to build a Kubernetes cluster. And it's just, that's sort of how I feel. I feel like they're, um, and I'd love to find some, I'll put a, a thing on it. Chris and I did a, a podcast about the operator pattern. Um, and I, I, it'd actually be fun to have somebody, I don't know if, if, if that's interesting to people, but there's this Kubernetes operator pattern. Um, it seems I, I'm very out to lunch on it. It feels like stored procedures from a database perspective <laughs> to me. Um, and I don't, I don't think, I used to write tons of stored procedures. I don't think that story ends well for people. Generally um, does not. Yeah, and so I'm like, I, I don't, I, and I know you're, you're, you know, and, and database admins are super excited about stored procedures too. And a, a year goes by, and then all of a sudden you're like, I don't remember how I did that, mm -hmm. or why I had this side effect when I changed this data set. So uh, I, I'm, in, I'm interested to pull, pull that in. It, I keep hoping um, that I was, you know, I was thinking I would come back and do a lunch and learn on what I've learned on the cluster API pieces. I just haven't had the time. It was so crazy to spin them up. Right, it, to, to build a Kubernetes cluster with cluster API, you have to start a Kubernetes cluster. And then the, that cluster builds a bunch of CRDs that contain Kubernetes, the, 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 the reference set for your cluster. And then you make requests against that reference cluster to then add machines to the reference cluster. It's way too You, you way hatch too the egg and then wait for it to have eggs to... Yep. Yeah. No, that's just... Yeah, so so that made, makes my... I, I just scratched my head on that and then... Uh, so we'll, you know, but it's every... The, 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 the community is pretty gaga on that. Um, and I don't blame them, right? It's, it's you know, a bit of saying, hey, Kubernetes is great. We're going to use Kubernetes uh, more and more. But I, I don't That's I, I would love to get somebody in to talk, talk more about, about that. Um, Actually, here's something that might be interesting to talk about at some point also is, uh, at, you know, just as a quest for topics, um, that kind of, there's a, Gentleman who who made CentOS um, uh, and Singularity and a couple other wonderful technologies, he's kind of uh, spearheading HPC NG, which is um, kind of a merging merging of HPC with uh, modern cloud and kind of putting them together and trying to make. HPC infrastructure look and work a lot like cloud infrastructure and vice versa. Okay. And uh, it's, it's just kind of getting started. Um, but there's some very good discussions around it that are happening right now. I'm trying to find the charter. There's a community charter um, that I is kind I've of being something about it. Okay. evaluated. Yeah, I've, I've contributed a little bit to that. And just on the what's the link on the hpcng.org? I'm sorry, hpcng.org. There's a link to the charge there. Oh, cool. Yeah, Nvidia. That's I was. I was. Nvidia is like I think really involved in it, right? Um, it wouldn't surprise me. I haven't had much interaction with that side of it. Okay. Um, this is, it's more along the lines of, uh, kind of integrating true HPC, like, um, many of the, um, national lab supers and that sort of thing. Um, and kind of modernizing the underlying operating systems and architectures to okay. kind of deal with containers, deal with, uh, cloud style methodologies, I would venture to call it and kind of working with that mindset and uh, how to bring oh, kind of the software okay. to, to make that happen. Oh yeah, that yeah, that's the charter. Yeah, Gre uh, Greg Kurtzner is the gentleman behind the uh, the big push for it. 
who kind of started yeah, the call to action. If you, if you know him um, and want to ask him to come in, that would be awesome. Yeah, I do. Um, I'll, I'll ask him to join and um, he might uh, want to definitely do that just to kind of at least just expose more, more people to it. I, it's always fun, like to me, and one of the, my goals with, with a group like this is to be able to pull together operations-minded people. Um, and I'm bringing, I'm slow on my panelist poke. Um, I'm bringing y'all over. Bring over operations-minded people to, um, you know, have a place where you can say, hey, I'm thinking about this and have operators be like, all right, if you do that, it's going to suck or, you know, that could work. And, and that's, we, we would do this. Um, I started something like that in the early Kubernetes days, but it was hard to get traction. Like I, I didn't, I didn't have enough pull in the community to get traction on it. Um, and then actually the, the cluster, this is actually funny. Um, it's funny, not sort of sad, I guess. But the cluster, so people were frustrated because I kept talking about like operationalizing clusters and doing that work. And they, their group of people came in and like, we just want to write a new installer for Kubernetes, but we're not going to write an installer. We're just going to do this boost, cluster bootstrapping thing. So Kube ADM and actually Cluster API forked out of all that, out of that, where it was developers working to spin up Kubernetes clusters, not operators. Um, which is, I mean, it's fun. They, they did, it, I don't know. I don't, they did something and it's, it's what got adopted. So yay, that's good. I, I don't think it's that, you know, it doesn't have the operational characteristics that I was hoping we would, we would build around Kubernetes. But I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the time to chase, to shout up and down in the Kubernetes communities as much as I would. Do you need somebody who's like not like you, not you know somebody who's actually installing it to fight? Yep. Uh, but it's helpful to be be able to bring somebody forward and say, "I'm thinking about doing this. What do you does that work operationally?" Yeah. Good. Well, it's good. It's good to have people who actually you know are in the tr in the trenches, uh, as you know, a case might be trying to deploy this stuff. And I mean, there's there's all sorts of companies who want to sell you the easy way to do these things but really it comes down to there is no easy way operationally to do this stuff because <laughs> it, it's complex it's it's by its nature and by its design it's complex but it has to be it has to be complex in order to be able to scale it has to be complex in order to be able to be secure it has to be complex in order to be performant um, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you know, these are real things that they, they, they just, I want it to work, you know, m make the ship go, uh, you know, to use the uh, Star Trek <clears throat> meme for that. But, um, well, I, I think that's actually very much in, in the same vein of what Rob's saying is developers have very different needs and they don't worry about the operational needs, which you're touching on. <laughs> developers don't about those and forced to think about those unless that's the cool sexy thing they like working on and so as a consequence you end up with very complex systems and we saw this in OpenStack where it was very much uh, developer oriented and this amazing system developers and then they started bringing the operators in and the operators are like this sucks this is terrible <laughs> I can't run infrastructure with this. Now, they worked very hard to, you know, shift and change, but they started a flawed platform in the beginning. And I see it also with Kubernetes. Kubernetes is very much a developer open platform. Now, grant that I think probably more operational use case patterns that were absorbed early on in Kubernetes. So I think it has a better trajectory and journey and yeah. an open stack did still suffer from a lot of the same fundamental flaws. And just like uh, Patrick was saying, it is complex and you can't hide that complexity. You have to make it accessible. Otherwise, it just won't work for the use cases out there in the real world. That makes sense. That was, uh, 
I have, a, I have an OpenStack Operator Summit story that you reminded me of, Shane, from that perspective, because the operators were all, we had, we had a big summit in New York with, the op, with, with OpenStack operators, and it was amazing because it was the real, right, people doing real scale operations. And uh, we had a, a session where everybody was ranting about um, MSMQ. And like every single person in the room hated MSMQ. Uh, which is the message bus connecting all the OpenStack services together. And, but they were all different reasons for hate. And, and somebody actually finally stood up and said, you know, I, I don't think the problem is MSMQ. I think the problem is that MSMQ is the place where everything, all the errors get surfaced, but it's not, it's not actually MSMQ, like it wasn't, it wasn't a scaling problem. It was a, you know, there was like every problem under the sun, but since MSMQ was in the middle of everything else, it was the, it was always the sort of the top of the, you know, the first thing that broke, you were like, all right, look at MSMQ, find out what's going on. Um, and it was easy to, to mistake the messenger for the message. And that, oh, yeah. I, that was like one of those big eyes open things to me. It was like, oh, shoot. All right. Not the actual problem. Yeah. If, you're, if your messenger is also your signaling stack, that can, <laughs> you know, if that's, if that's how you, you get alerts and that sort of thing, but also that happens to be how the services right. communicate and that's your mesh, then. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Or, or it's, or something's flooding you with messages that are inappropriate. It's like, Oh wait. Okay. Yeah. You're flooding the messaging system because there's something else breaking, but yeah, that was Kubernetes did better with that CD and direct APIs to SCD, but that has its own fallbacks from that perspective. Right. Definitely. Um, search gen being the biggest problem on it. That was, actually, um, one thing to, does, does anybody want to talk about TLS and certificate propagation? Mm. It's like a super operator topic, but I don't know who I'd bring in to talk about it, but it's, it's like right up there. It's such a basic thing and it's super hard to get right. Yes, it is. Um, I've, I've messed it up myself many a time. So... <laughs> Just, just experimenting and trying and getting it working. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had a hard time with it. Um, I don't know that. Uh, trying to think, who would be a good speaker for it? TLS there, in what context? Just managing uh, your TLS infrastructure, um, like PKI infra, or the like yeah, your CA. It's it's your CA, but it's actually propagating certificates like. The thing, the thing that I see people having a lot of trouble with, um, and maybe this has gotten better with um, Let's Encrypt, maybe, which, I mean, but now you're talking about DNS, so you've got DNS and CA, but people aren't, aren't necessarily building valid certificates for all their endpoints. Mm -mm. They're relying um, on Let's Encrypt to do it for them in a lot of ways, and they're also relying on, on kind of the kube underpinnings to, to generate it for them and then trusting them blindly. And so if somebody is being malicious, you really can't tell. Um, that's, that's one of those things that mm. we mean. So we did, to, to Michael's point, we did a, ton, a, a bunch of work on, and David, I see you uh, in it. Um, yeah. The, yeah, I was gonna, I was go gonna say, I'm not sure it would really be, honestly, Rob, worth an entire lunch and learn, but but uh, you guys did some development for us so that we could import um, TLS certificates into our uh, base metal controllers. Yeah. And we're also using similar code for uh, our ASX instances. But so, there's I mean, a lot to be said about whether you do TLS to the service or TLS to the endpoint. So for example, in Amazon where, where I'm comfortable, is you definitely do SSL to the load balancer and then from the load balancer back to the service. Is that something that has to be encrypted in the world of, in the world of cloud, world of serverless, in a world of all these different things? Is how much do you trust the infrastructure once you're inside the data center? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
so I don't know if anybody saw, but China has just disabled all TLS uh, version one. Uh, all TLS version 1.3. So the idea is in TLS 1.3, they have the ESNI, which yeah. means you can't spy on the, on the SNI, on the host that you're trying to go to anymore. The destination, you can't see the destination anymore is the whole point. <sighs> and, so they're forcing and, people to downgrade to 1.1 or 1.2? Mm -hmm. Yep. Ah, so what were we going to say, Rob? I No, wow. I didn't realize. That's crazy. Not crazy. No, it makes perfect sense for China. On <laughs> well, they need to know where it's going so they can decide to block it, right? Right. Yeah, so like in general, man in the middle, d doing SSL decryption, whether that's good or bad. Uh, we had an issue that somewhere in our organization, they decided to do SSL decryption in order to understand what was broken in some protocol. And they didn't realize that if you have the server certificate, you can put something in front of it that will give you a different certificate and then encrypt it back. But yeah, right. they didn't realize that we were doing client SSL authentication coming in. So they couldn't spoof our client certificate for sure. And um, uh, wait, how do we get into this? PKI. PKI. No, this is, <laughs> we, did, we did some work in the early Kubernetes days and it, it just went nowhere. Like it dropped like a rock, um, which always may, amazes me. Um, where we were building a PKI per cluster. And then, and then making sure that the, we actually like all of the, the points were actually we build a PKI for the cluster based on the names of the systems and everything. You didn't need public names. You could, if you did it, if you trusted your, the root, if you know, you had a private root of trust, you could make all that stuff work. Um, and it, Felt like a really good solution to us. So that sounds like that's actually the right way to do it. That's what I felt. But oh my god, I couldn't get anybody to care. Well, <laughs> why? Why? Why do you care about you know that sort of thing? Why do you care about the, the your certificates? You just they're just identifying a machine, right? I mean, that's <laughs> that's, that's, that's sadly that's sadly the mentality that I'm constantly kind of. Uh, you know, faced with when trying to talk about security aspects, it's like, why? It's not important. It's just a machine. It's just the connection between two points. You know, why does that matter? Ah, uh, well, this that and you make me remember why people what why we didn't keep promoting it is Kubernetes at the time. I think they fixed this since didn't have a way to specify multiple multiple certs. Mm -hmm. And so what would happen is you would get, um, you would, if you had to change, if you had to rotate your certs, there was no way to rotate the cert. Um, and so what would end up happening is you would, you would basically have to take this, the cluster down or parts of the cluster down while you did that rotation. Um, so it wasn't, it, it just wasn't particularly usable from that perspective. It's fine if you're doing all public certs through Let's Encrypt. And I guess with public cloud, you get named machines pretty much for free, and you can just encrypt whatever machine you get using a public using a public key service, a public encryption service. It's an amazing thing to you know, basically have free certificates. It wasn't always the case. It's amazing, but it's also absurd that it didn't exist beforehand. The whole concept, I mean, this is a rant. I mean, you could find someone that would rant on this for hours. The whole concept of why the hell does an SSL certificate cost $2,000? Yeah. Like you want a three-year wildcard SSL from GoDaddy, you could spend thousands of dollars on that. It was expensive. I mean, but what are you doing? You're the... Yeah, it's frustrating. I, like, yeah, no, you have to use what So someone could run... 20 lines of Python code for you. <laughs> but some of it was because at the time we were using them not for encryption as much as trust, mm -hmm. right? So it was supposed to be that you had a trusted website, you got the green lock and somebody verified some. Yeah, there was a time when you'd get a phone call. Yes. Yep, yep. there was a time when you'd actually have to show your incorporation you know, papers in order to get, you know, a high level cert to 
get a high, you know, a domain level cert or something along those lines. You'd have to, you know, state that, you know, <laughs> yes, I own this business name. Yes, I can have this domain. Yes, I can have this SSL cert for this domain, you know. Absolutely. Make sure of your passport. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, not that deep, but. It felt, it felt that. And then it was all sort of sketchy because we kept using, what, thought mm. out of our uh, thwait, out of uh, South, South Africa. Mm. And then there was Komodo that got hacked and thought that got okay. hacked and one by one. Well, yeah. It, that's what, what, yeah. PGP keys are still real. Open web of trust still exists and it still works. <laughs> it, it, it didn't work for the SSL chain of trust. So I, I'm still an open CA certifier and, um, hmm. you know, I've probably certified 10 people in 10 years. Oh, really? That? It, it's just there's there's not a lot of interest in it so the 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 let's encrypt guys definitely figured out the right the right model for this yeah do they do they make money is do they have a profit mode is there some i don't know how they i, how they I thought it. they were initially doing it just as a service just like to literally say we we want more ssl so you know we want more trust in communications and i I thought they originally did it like they're like, yeah, we can automate it and it won't cost us anything to manage the service. So, But I'm sure they figured out a monetization strategy for that. Um, all right. I'm looking at the clock. Um, and I, I do want to talk about cloud 2030 and, and that transition a little bit um, as, as a wrap up and have, have people go. Cause what we've got a whole bunch of more, more topics. If you know somebody to talk on this stuff, you know, bring it, Otherwise, we, we've already demonstrated that we could just make this a topic and then riff on it for, for uh, an hour. And I, I think that would be cool. Um, the, so here's, here's what's, what, I'm, what I've been doing. Um, I'll back up and give you sort of the, the mission from that perspective. I'm, I'm really sort of frustrated in IT in general, that we're, we don't think much about where we're going. And, and so some of the people I interact with um, in a reg, on an ongoing basis did this thing to, seven years ago called Cloud 2020, where they got a bunch of people together, they made predictions, it was like a one day summit. Um, and I've been sort of working towards that with this idea of if we don't describe what we think the future should look like, it's gonna just look like Amazon a hundred times bigger. Um, which isn't necessarily, you know, uh, that's not the future I want to see because I don't, I don't think that's, that's good for anybody except Amazon. Um, I'm happy to have the debate with somebody who loves Amazon. That's, that's great. Um, and so I, I've, I sort of the answer to that became we need to sit down and think about what the future, what the future looks like. Uh, and do it in a way that we can actually write down, this is what we want the future to look like, and this is all the things that could go wrong, and this is how, you know, these are the rocket packs that we were actually, the jet packs we were promised. Um, and so that's what Cloud 2030 is. And I, I found this thing called Mighty Networks, which is a, it's a community site that lets you have like chat, like it's got Slack features, it's got, yeah, definitely hoverboards too. Uh, it's got Slack and, uh, posting abilities and threaded discussions, and it's pretty easy to post a video in there um, and collect people together. And so right now it's just play, wide open. What I want to do is instead of running this group out of the Racken website, so because every time I post a link, it looks like it's a Racken thing. Um, and you know we're we're doing a, we're doing the work to sort of keep the the threads going, but that's not my my goal isn't to promote Racken out of these discussions. It's to have good discussions. So I want to take the DevOps lunch and learn, keep the time, just move the coordination and the meetings and stuff like that to cloud 2030. And then of course, invite everybody here to participate in that uh, effort more broadly. So this, to me, what we're doing here is sort of the tactics and the operational pieces, which, you know, I, I love having a place to vent and talk about this and say, this is what's going on uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then, we also have a place to talk about where we want things to go. Um, and that's going to run right now. We're running it Thursday uh, at, I'll do it in Pacific time, 8 a.m. Pacific time. So 10 central. Um, 
and we're trying to do a weekly cadence with that. That one I'm going to be, uh, I'm trying to be less hands-on. So I'm, I'm finding people who have topics that want to talk about and then letting them sort of be captains of the topic. So 8 a.m. just really doesn't work for me, Rob. <laughs> I know. I, I was originally doing I, it th at Free Rocky. I'm not awake at that time. I'm barely awake at nine most days. <laughs> And, and I am, I am very open to continuing to rotate it. I'm also open to taking these sessions and starting to use this as some rotation also. So this, here's, here's what I'm trying to do. I don't want to make all the decisions. Um, I'm going to provide enough because I know that if there's nothing, then nobody has, you can't do anything. But Rocky, that was the, the discussion uh, last week. They were like, no, we don't want this afternoon stuff. Throw it first thing in the morning. And so, um, we'll see how that runs. I'm going to record them and actually I'm going to do start doing transcripts also. So it'll be easy to come back and, and moderate. And then the goal is not to make it strictly interactive sessions, but to pull things back. That's the nice thing about the transcripts, pull things back for discussions in the community. Um, and Rocky, I, I'm happy to voice the, I don't like that time. <laughs> Thank you. Noted. So I'm, I'm no, no, I, I, it's easy for me because that's not first thing. Um, mm -hmm. But they, they were pretty emphatic when we discussed it um, <laughs> from that perspective. So, so what I would ask is, you know, please make sure you register for the Cloud 2030 uh, site. I'll post a link to it in the chat if y'all haven't seen it already. Um, But what, what I wanted to emphasize with this is while that's cloud 2030, I think that they're, they're well overlapped topics. And so don't be shy about, you know, if that's all, if you only care about this, then stay, you know, we'll keep doing this here. It has its own thread, but please don't be shy about participating in the broader conversations too. And helping define it. We're, it's going to be a couple of months. Ops people are well known for their shyness and their lack of opinionation. I, uh, you know, sometimes they, they, I, it's hard to coax ops people into the light. That's true. You, in a basement, throw down some pizza, you know, fast internet. I, well, I'm thinking about my experience, like from the OpenStack and even Kubernetes days, you can, you can get the developers of those platforms to talk about how great the platforms are. The operators tend to feel like they're running snowflakes and don't want to share much. Mm. That's been, that's been, it's like, well, my problems are my problems. So I don't, nobody else has my problems. And I can tell you from Rack N's experience, I'll tell this might be the closing, closing joke if you want to talk about, it. but we see, we see this all the time. People come up to us and they're like, don't tell anybody, but my data center is so broken and busted. I had to make all these decisions about this and I, I run my infrastructure in these crazy ways. And we're just like, everybody does it that way. It's not you. Everybody <laughs> does it. Spreadsheets. Spreadsheets, oh, weird yeah. naming conventions, IP, right, IP strategies that have tons of holes in them, mm -hmm. you know, operating system installs that, that take weird left turns. Um, tons of cron jobs. Cron, yeah, cron jobs everywhere. Um, you know, mm -hmm. rotate, you know, everybody's sharing the same SSH keys onto the public. It, it's, it, you know, it's, they're, none of them are hundred percent the same, but the degree of overlap that we see because people have had to work around the same problems. Um, but everybody's embarrassed. So they don't, they don't share the, they don't share it. Um, we have at, at hacker events, I go to all these secure mm -hmm. uh, computer security events and we have what's called security nightmares. And it's where people get up, on stage and talk about like the worst thing that's happened to them. Like their worst, oh. da worst day on the job. And it's not recorded. I mean, because some of these yeah. are whatever. Um, it's very not recorded and very hush hush, but the stories are amazing. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear, that would actually be a fun recap on this. Um, yeah, but we, we have to maybe turn off the recording. All right, everybody, I, I do have to run and close this up. Uh, next week is Charity Majors, uh, then IPv6 with Ed Hurley. So amazing topics coming up. I'll uh, we'll see you and maybe see you Thursday morning. For those of you who don't. <laughs> don't
don't have a problem with the uh, time. Rocky, sorry. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a good, good one. Everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Pleasure.